Hi everybody, in this video I want to talk about Azure Bastion, a managed junk box service. As always, this is useful, a like and subscribe is appreciated and hit the bell icon to get notified of new content. I can think about, initially at least, I have various resources in Azure. These resources could be, for example, Windows, virtual machines, so I might want to connect to those with things like RDP. So 3389. I may be using things like WinRM. So with WinRM, we have the 5985 for the regular or 6 for the HTTPS. I may have Linux boxes. And for Linux, typically, we're going to use SSH, so port 22. And I have multiple of these in my environment. Now, no, I can use SSH to talk to Windows. I can use RDP to talk to Linux. There's just some additional components we have to install. But typically, we RDP to Windows, we SSH to Linux. Now, I might want to be able to connect to these from other machines on the network. I might want to be able to connect to them from the internet, although that, that's always a very kind of dangerous thing. So we try and be super careful about having that type of access from the internet. Now to avoid these having to have some just maybe publicly accessible or just open to lots and lots of different network endpoints, we like the idea of a jump box. And what we get with a jump box is we have some piece of infrastructure. And the whole point is that jump box, it is the thing we connect to. So it has some endpoint. Now this could be a public IP. If I wanted to make this available to the internet, it might just be a regular IP on a virtual machine to connect to internal networks. But I have this public endpoint that is kind of tied into the jump box. And then that jump box through there, so I would connect to the jump box operating system and then jump hop from this to something else that it has available via RDP, via SSH. So what this avoids is these backend destinations, they no longer have to have IP addresses that are accessible directly from maybe all other networks that are accessible from the internet. The only thing I have to worry about is allowing RDP and SSH from the jump box and then I have just this, I have to think about hardening and worrying about this has some accessible endpoint that things might be able to connect to. So I can lock down RDP and SSH from my back ends to only come from the jump box, and I can really focusing on hardening the jump box and its endpoint, which is really important, especially if this is internet facing. So it's gonna enable me to do this. So I can really think about with this, it could be Yes, coming from the internet, or it could just be other networks. This could be maybe from on-premises. Maybe I'm coming in from a express route, um, private peering, could be a site-to-site -site VPN, whatever that might be, they're all connecting via this endpoint, going to the jump box, and then from there connecting to other things. So where does Azure Bastion come into this? I could just create my own jump box, virtual machine, but I then have to worry about locking that down. I have to worry about, well, with this endpoint, is it public facing? I have to worry about port scanning, um, zero day vulnerabilities. I'd probably want multiple jump boxes for scale, for resiliency, so there's load balance, there's lots of other considerations to this. So the whole point of what Azure Bastion is giving me, it's a managed jump box offering. So if I looked at these components right here, this is really what Azure Bastion is going to offer me. It's offering me a managed jump box experience. Now with that said, I drew a single jump box. That is not going to be the case. There's going to be multiple jump boxes that make up Azure Bastion. It's going to use a virtual machine scale set behind the scenes. And as we'll see in a second, 
some of the SKUs let us set the number of those based on well, how many concurrent connections do I want to be able to support. So it's multi-instance. It's going to use a public today endpoint. So this is a standard public IP. It is IPv4. So it's an IPv4 endpoint that I'm going to connect to. It's IPv4 I'm connecting to on the back end. It does not support IPv6 today. It's obviously because there's multiple instances, the public endpoint doesn't actually go directly to the jump boxes. You can really think about, well, that endpoint really is gonna to belong to a load balancer. So it's gonna be a load balancer that owns the endpoint, which would then go to the various backends on that configuration. So that's how Azure Bastion is gonna be focused. And then the whole point of this is, in terms of the connectivity I'm connecting into this, hey, I can use the Azure portal. I can also use the native tools when I'm using the standard SKU. And again, I'm gonna come back and talk about that. So the whole deal of this, it's managed experience. I deploy it really with a few clicks. It deploys into my virtual network. It's in a managed offering. They're worrying about, hey, this public endpoint, and it is a public endpoint. So it's designed to, uh, hey, I can access it via the internet. I could also access it via peered VNets um, from on-premises, but it is gonna go via a public endpoint whenever I'm using this service. But it's now Azure Bastion's job to worry about people port scanning me, about those zero day vulnerabilities. I'm not having to directly open up RDP or SSH or WinRM out there to the internet. It is a public endpoint today. There is no private endpoint support. For example, I can't, even though this is deployed within my network, it is always accessed by this public IP address. I can't use like an internal load balancer today. I can't project a private endpoint into a virtual network. So it's all via this public endpoint today. And again, it's integrated with the portal. I can use the native tooling. In terms of authentication, there is no Azure Bastion conditional access cloud app I can reference. If I wanna lock down the access to this and apply conditional access, I'll use the regular Microsoft Azure Management cloud app. Now, obviously that, that's very broad. That's really the Azure Resource Manager. That's the portal, that's the CLI, that's PowerShell. But that would apply to this as well if I did wanna use um, conditional access. There is no native SSO or MFA drivers through Azure Bastion alone. If I was using some of the Azure AD login extensions on these, you may see certain enhancements there to single sign on to MFA. You'd really wanna play around with those. And the great thing about this is, when I'm leveraging this service, I can connect to absolutely things on the same virtual network as the deployment of Azure Bastion. But additionally, if I have other virtual networks, so if I have another VNet, so we'll say VNet2, and I have peered this, I can connect to resources over there as well, providing it's the same Azure AD tenant. So it could be in a different subscription. I'm peering the network, different regions even, but it does have to be under the same Azure AD tenant because when I'm trying to connect via Bastion, it won't show me Bastions that are under different Azure AD tenants. So I can connect to machines on peered networks, different subscriptions, different regions, but if it is a different subscription, it must trust the same Azure AD tenant. There is also the ability, I can think about if I had other networks, as long as I have an IP route, that's gonna work as well. Now this is soon, so this is kinda in the future, this is gonna be lit up. And that would enable me to use Azure Bastion to technically go and connect to things on premises. As long as I have Express Route Private Peering or Site Site VPN, if there's an IP way for me to get to it, I'll be able to say, hey, via the Bastion, go and connect to this IP address. And as long as I can get there from the VNet the Bastion's deployed to, that's just gonna work. So that's in pre private preview right now, but that's coming. That's on that roadmap to be able to do this.
Now, when I talked about Azure Bastion, I did say, hey, there's two instances, but there can be more. Uh, I could maybe use different protocols. The reason for that is there's two different SKUs of Azure Bastion. As always, there's the idea of a basic SKU. So with the basic SKU, as the name suggests, for my Linux VMs, I can connect using the standard port 22 SSH. For my Windows, I can connect using RDP. Again, the standard protocols for that, the standard 3389 port. I can't use a different port. I can't use SSH to connect to Windows or RDP to connect to Linux. It doesn't allow me to do that. And in terms of instances, there will be two. So there are two instances within here. Then we have the idea of the, I'll do a different color, maybe we'll highlight a little bit. Then there's the idea of the standard SKU. Now the big deal about the standard SKU is it is gonna enable this idea to have an IP-based connect. And think about that's useful not just for connecting to things maybe on-premises, but if I do have peered VNets that are under different Azure AD tenants, I'd be able to connect to those as well. I can also have custom ports and protocol, i.e. I don't have to use 3389 for RDP, I don't have to use 22 for SSH. I could use SSH to connect to Windows. I could use RDP to connect to Linux, providing I've added those extensions into it to enable me to use those other protocols. This lets me do file transfer. For Windows, it's just a regular RDP client cut paste. If it's Linux, I establish a tunnel, then I can use SCP. That's only available in standard. I actually have the option to have feature configuration. And what that means is there's all these different features gets added over time. I can turn them on or off. And then the other big deal I can do with this is this is scalable. I can have from two to 50 instances. Now it doesn't auto scale. It's not looking at the amount of traffic and to add an instance from my scale set or then decrease them. But I can go in and kind of do a slider and change the number of instances I actually want. Now this is all called out in the documentation. So if I load up documentation quickly, here we can see, hey, the different SKUs that are available. And it talks about those features. So it's connect to target VMs in peered VNets. That's available on basic and standard. Linux VM private keys in the key vault. So when I do the connection, I can actually say, hey, the key to connect to it is in my Azure key vault. And then it's Linux using SSH, Windows using RDP. But then all the remaining features that host scaling, the custom ports, Linux using RDP, Windows using SSH, upload, download, these are not available in basic, they're only available in the standard SKU. And if I go and look at my deployment, if I go and quickly look at my bastion, and I look at my configuration, so this is where you can see, notice I could turn things on or off, because I am running the standard SKU. So right now, my option are, hey, I can enable or disable native client support. And notice I can change the number of instances. I have it set to two, but technically I could go all the way up to 50. Obviously I'm gonna pay more money, but I can do that. Likewise, in the overview, let's change those things. We can see it is a public IP address. That's how I'm connecting to this. And it's showing me the virtual network and the subnet that this bastion has actually been deployed to. Now I am running standard in my environment. You can change from basic to standard. So you can upgrade. So if I deployed basic originally, now I want some of the enhanced features or I wanna change the scaling, I can do that. So I can go from basic to standard. So I can upgrade. I cannot downgrade. I cannot go from standard to basic. So those are some of the rules around how those kind of fit together. So let's talk about what makes this tick a little bit more. So from a deployment perspective, it's actually super, super simple. 
In fact, if I think about the deployment, if I don't have a Bastion deployed right now, and I just try to select Bastion under a virtual machine, and there's no Bastion it can get to, i.e. I've selected a VM in a VNet that's not peered to another VNet that has a Bastion, or maybe I'm in a VNet that's part of a subscription that trusts a different Azure AD tenant, where I have a Bastion deployed, it's gonna say, hey, do you wanna deploy a Bastion? And it will just go and set it all up for me, and then I'd be able to use Bastion. So once again, if I jumped over super, super quickly, we can kind of see that behavior. So if I just went and looked at a virtual machine, so this virtual machine I'm gonna look at is an NVA that's in a VNet that is not peered to my VNet where I have my Bastion. So if I go and go to connect, so it's fully integrated, and I try and select Bastion, if I say use Bastion, it's gonna say, hey, do you wanna just deploy it? It's specifying some configurations, a resource group, it's gonna use a virtual network, all of these things. It's gonna just go and create a bastion for me. Or I could say, hey, I wanna go and configure this manually. Or obviously I can just go to bastions, and I can go and create one. There's not a huge amount of configurations to this. It's really all about selecting, hey, where am I doing it? What region, what tier, the number of instances I want and that kind of virtual network and that standard public IP. I could use an existing one, as long as it's in the same region and it is a standard SKU, but it's actually super, super simple to actually go and deploy. So when I think about that deployment, what's actually happening here is, obviously it deploys into my virtual network. So if I think about, hey, I have my VNet, So this is my VNet. It wants a subnet called Azure Bastion subnet. So I'm gonna create a subnet called Azure Bastion subnet. It should be at minimum a slash 26. It used to be a slash 27, but that was before it started to introduce the idea of it could scale beyond two instances. So I want that slash 26, and maybe I want bigger, depending on how many I plan to actually scale it to, but 26 is now the minimum that it's gonna allow me to do. I can only have one Bastion instance deployed into this subnet. I cannot deploy other things into this subnet. It's exclusively for the use of Azure Bastion. I cannot apply user-defined routes to this subnet. It's, again, exclusively for this. And what it's going to deploy into this is, well, I can think about that load balancer. Obviously, it's then tying into that public IP, which again is of a standard SKU, which is the front end configuration for my load balancer. And then it's gonna have, well, at minimum two, and only two if it's basic instances of the bastion, but potentially more. If I'm using that standard SKU, I can scale it to, hey, three, four, five, whatever I need to actually meet the number I need. Now I do pay based on the SKU and the number of instances and the amount of egress traffic. If we go and look at the pricing calculator for a second, we can see, well, what am I paying for? So there's the basic and the standard SKU so it's 19 cents an hour for basic versus 29 cents an hour for standard. So that's the two instances I'm paying for there. So that covers two. If I want additional instances for standard, well, it's basically half the price because, hey, two costs 29 cents, so one costs 14 cents. So I pay for those additional instances. Then there's certain amounts of outbound data transfer up to five gigabytes a month. It's free. Then I start to pay for the additional egress. So that's how these things are actually priced. Now if you think about, well okay, I'm paying for the number of instances I have, how many instances do I, do I need? What is this going to support? And the guidance I found in the documentation really boils down to per instance, so for each one I have, in a medium amount of workload, 
I can think about 25 concurrent RDP sessions or 50 SSH. So that's how I can think about. So if I was gonna have 250 concurrent RDP sessions, well, I'd probably want 10 instances, or maybe even an extra one for some resiliency of something failed or whatever. These are not hard limits. This is, hey, based on testing Microsoft have done with what they consider a medium amount of workload, that's a good number to support. You could have way more than that, you could have less than that. You would need to test, and again, what is your type of workload and what is the effort put involved in those to work out what is your correct number. And I'll, I'll show at the end, there are some metrics you can actually see, well, how busy are those instances really? Could I have more con connecting to those or do I need to add some additional instances? So this is how I think about what it's doing, and that's really all it is. It's this managed jump box appliance that's deploying into my virtual network. And once again, the whole point of this today is if I had other VNets, so it's VNet2, as long as it's peered, and it's, remember, that same AAD tenant, I can connect to those as well and I'll actually show this. This could be a different subscription, different regions, so it's global VNet peering, but I can use this bastion to connect to those as well. Now, do think about the performance. If I was physically sitting near this region, for example, and my bastion is on the other end of the country, and then I'm connecting back to a VM that's in the same region where I physically sit. So if I'm on the East Coast and the VM's on the East Coast, my bastion was on the West Coast, well realize, yes, I can use it, but realize I'm doing this big hairpin every single time. So in terms of my latency, that's gonna impact me. So while I can use it cross regions, make sure you do consider the latency. In that case, it might be better to have a bastion also on the East Coast, in addition to the West Coast, so I get the best performance. So just make sure you, latency, there's a physical distance, it's gonna impact that performance. So make sure you do think about that. In terms of the specifics of the actual communications, so the communications coming in is 443. So whether I'm using the portal, whatever I'm doing, it's a 443 to the public IP. Now the recommendation is not to apply an NSG to that subnet. They say, don't do that. If you do have to apply it, there is an article that talks through if you are gonna use NSGs. And what it's basically gonna stress is, look, the ingress traffic is port 443. I do not have to enable 3389 or 22. But realize there's also control plane traffic from things like the gateway manager. It needs to be able to talk to certain other things from the load balancer. So there's a few things it has to be able to do. And of course, then there's egress out to the data plane. So it goes through all the ports you would actually need. Then it talks about the target VM subnet. So you very well may have an NSG on that. And the nice thing here is if I think about, well, if the subnet, so this is a different subnet. Again, it could be the same VNet, could be a different virtual network. It doesn't matter at this point. But let's say this is a, a subnet two and this is where my resources are. Could be Windows, could be Linux, it doesn't matter. If I'm applying an NSG, what I have to say is, look, coming from this IP range, so that Azure Bastion subnet has an, a CIDR range, I have to allow, oh, what happened now? I have to allow from this IP range, whatever port I'm using. So, hey, I need to allow 3389, if it's regular port RDP, 22. Maybe I also need to allow, remember if I'm using WinRM, the 5985, 5986, whatever those might be, I need to allow those. If I was using custom ports, I need to allow those. Same would apply if I'm using a subnet in a different virtual network. If it has an NSG, it's the IP range of that Azure Bastion subnet that I have to allow through, and all it needs is the ports that I'm connecting from. The source is the Azure Bastion subnet, not my IP, it doesn't care about my IP. My IP is talking to the Azure Bastion, then it's jumping, hopping to the backend resources. So the only rule required, and that's the huge benefit here, is from the Azure Bastion subnet. 
IP range. It could be 10.0.14/24. That might be my Azure Bastion subnet's IP range. So that's the one I have to allow through. It is all TLS protected, so it's 443 over the internet. And this is the only place I have to enable those ports to come from. I don't have to enable RDP or SSH from anywhere else. It's letting me lock that down. Now, one thing you may ask is, oh, okay, I know one of the things we like to do today is all about JIT, just in time. And I can configure that on a per VM, Windows, Linux, whatever that might be. And what just in time does is it modifies the network security groups to block RDP, to block SSH, whatever ports I configure. And when I want to connect to it, I have to go and say, hey, uh, I want to enable access from this IP for this duration of time. Azure Bastion does not natively integrate with JIT today. Normally, I think their guidance would be you could add almost like an exception. So you have priorities for the rules in the NSG. You could add a higher rule to allow, hey, from this IP range, allow it into these. Maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe that's not an OK thing for you to have. In which case, you'll have to go and enable JIT every time I want to connect to it via the jump box. Now, normally, when I use just in time, I specify my IP address as what I want to add the exception for, like my public facing IP. That is not what I'm going to do here. When I create the rule, remember that the connection of RDP or 22 is actually coming from the Azure Bastion subnet. So when I go and make that request to just in time, the source IP will be a range. I'm going to say I want to specify a range, and the range is going to be whatever your Azure Bastion subnet is. So in that exception you're raising is going to be the Azure Bastion subnet IP range. For example, it mine could be 10.0.4.0 um, slash 24. That's where mine is deployed to. So when I was doing my JIT exception, say not an exception, but I want to allow access, I would say, hey, I want to enable for this IP range 10.0.4.0 slash 24, because that's the side of range of my Bastion subnet. And sure, I want to enable that for 3389 because it's Windows for the next three hours. Check, go. Now, when I connect via the Bastion, I'll be able to get to it because it would have added that exception to the network security group for three hours to say, hey, things in the Azure Bastion subnet are allowed to connect via RDP to these resources. So it doesn't natively work with JIT, as in I can just say, hey, I want to connect, and it does it for me. I would have to go to Defender for Cloud, Workload Protections, just in time, allow access, IP range of the Bastion subnet for whatever duration that is, and then it will go and work. So I have to think about doing that. So it's probably the nice thing to do at this point is let's just kind of see these in action. And I did kind of stress the point that I can use both the Azure portal and I can use the native tools. So I want to really be able to show both of those. So if I jump over, so I've got a couple of different VMs. What I'm going to show is from the portal first. So my Azure Bastion, remember, is in South Central US. So the first thing I'm going to do is show connecting to a VM in a peered virtual network. So if I look at my virtual machines, what I can see here is I'm going to connect to this VM right here because this VM right here is in East US. So if it's in East US, it has to be a different VNet because VNets cannot span regions. Now I have already, I am using JIT. So I have already in my environment gone and requested the JIT exception. So I've enabled that for my Azure Bastion subnet. And I can actually say, hey, I want to connect and I want to connect by the Bastion. Notice it's already telling me, hey, I'm going to use the Bastion in South Central Bastion host. That's the one it's going to use. It knows it's a different VNet. It knows it has a peer. It knows I have permission to it. I'm just going to use it. So then all I have to do is put in my username. 
and my password and say connect. So this is a HTML5 capable browser. So I'm using Edge, but any HTML5 capable browser will do. So I've now connected to that virtual machine. It, it's really that simple. Likewise, I could go and connect to a Linux. So I've got this Linux, I created it just for this, just to show the SSH, exactly the same thing again. Connect please. Now notice it does support, hey, I could use SSH private keys, I could use it from the key vault. All of those options are available. Mine is super simple, I just use the password, but I can say Azure user, and I'll type in my password, if I get it correct, and connect. And once again, I've got JIT enabled for this. I went and added a JIT exception, uh, or access request, from my Azure Bastion to this. So just remember, the NSG still applied. This is not working around it. Normally, NSGs allow virtual network to virtual network, so there's not a problem with that. But if you do have other rules to block it, like JIT, or something more specific, you need to do make sure you enable that Azure Bastion subnet connectivity. So that was showing it through the portal. It's super, super simple, super integrated. Now, what's gonna come later on is you would have that ability to also connect to those IP, and you'll do that via the Bastion. So under the Bastion, there'll be a connect option. But let's use the native tools. Let's have something a bit more fun. So you have to do an AZ login. So you've logged in, you've set a certain subscription. I've done all that already. Now, if you wanna use the native tools, remember, I'm gonna actually initiate this through the Azure CLI. So I've got the Azure CLI installed, and I need the SSH extension. So if I do an AZ extension list, what we'll see is I've already added the SSH extension. It's here. But I would have just done an AZ extension add name SSH. It's that simple. Now what I need to do now is I need to know what is the VM I'm actually going to connect to. So I can do a listing of my virtual machines. And all I really care about is the ID. So I can dump out all of my virtual machines in a table. So, I, okay, there's all my VMs. And I also need to know, well, what's my bastion? So once again, I could then dump out what is my bastion. I just need to know the resource group and the name. So that gives me that information as well under this little output. So from here, I have to use the AZ command to actually connect. And what I'm gonna show initially is connecting to a Linux box. Now it's gonna be the same Linux box I connected to before. I'm too lazy to type out the whole command. So just clears this for a second. If I jump over here, keep this neat. So this is the command. So I'm using the AZ network bastion. Then I'm saying I want to SSH. And then the next parameters is just telling me, well, the name of the bastion, South Central Bastion host, and then the resource group that bastion is in. And then the only other part is what is my target resource ID? So I'm telling it, hey, the resource ID of my Linux VM, and I'm telling it I want to use password for the authentication type, and what is my username? So the only thing I have to type in is my password. So I'm triggering that. And then I need the password. So I'll type in the same password as before. And again, it's using the native tooling now. So it's just using the regular SSH. I've installed SSH as well. So I'm now connected. That's it. I'm using the native tooling to connect. And likewise, oh, exit. And the same thing works on Windows. I would just specify a different resource ID and instead of SSH, I'll say RDP. So once again, we'll paste in the command and I missed off the letter A, so I'll go all the way back. But you can see the command is saying, hey, AZ Network Bastion, but this time it's RDP instead of SSH. The same Bastion, just a different resource. And now it's just gonna open up MSTSC. So you can see how it's connecting. And once again, I just need to enter my credential. 
Do you want to connect? Yes, please. But it's going via the Bastion service and I'm now connected to it. Now, the other nice thing about using this native tooling right here is we can actually see, well, there's, there's files. And one of the recent pieces of functionality is the file copy. So I'm gonna take a file from here. I'm just gonna copy this. And then if I open up my local browser, so if I just go over here, and let's say this is my local machine, and I can say paste, notice I now have that paste worked. So I'm copying an image in this case between the various machines. So that is just available to me. So that's leveraging now that native client um, on the environment. Now I can also do that for Linux. Now if I use Linux, and it's just a bit more involved, I go and open up a tunnel first and then use SCP. The documentation has all the steps. It's really the same set of steps, but you'll notice I use an AZ Network Bastion tunnel instead of SSH. And then once I have the tunnel established, I just use the SCP command to actually do the various um, file copies between them. And it's really that simple and easy to use. It's one of the really cool things about this. Now, I mentioned earlier about the number of like 25 RDPs and 50 SSH. How do I know how busy my bastion actually is? So if we jump over for a second, and what I wanna do now is if we just go back to that portal, if I go and look at my bastion, it does have some nice metrics. Now, firstly, I could see if I had sort of concurrent sessions, I'd be able to see my sessions right here that's actually connected. But if I go to metrics, there's total memory, used CPU, used memory, session counts. I have these available. So maybe I care about the amount of CPU. So I can actually see the CPU I'm using. Now remember, there's two instances. So one of the things I can do is I can apply splitting. So if I apply splitting, I wanna do it on an instance level. Once again, I have these options available. And now I'll see the CPU per instance. I have two, so I have two different lines. The two different instances, you can see it's got a VM zero and VM one in my scale set that Azure Bastion has deployed. But realize I can also add things like the session count per instance. I can do that splitting on all of the different metrics that are actually available. Um, so that's it. It's, it is actually a very simple service, but it's super powerful for when I want to have that jump box experience. Slash 26 subnet. Understand what is my workload that's coming into here. Probably going to want to use standard if I need more than maybe 50 RDP or 100 SSH, for example. Use the metrics to work out well, how busy is it really so I can get a real number. Remember, these are not hard limits, it's just recommendations. Do consider the networking rules required. If I don't have the default just VNet to VNet allowed and I do have some restrictions, I need to be allowing access from that Azure Bastion subnet, either through regular NSG or if I'm using JIT, that's the exception I have to go and add. This is growing. They're constantly adding new functionality to that. It's a pretty exciting time. I didn't show the IP-based connection because it's in a private preview, but it's a super simple experience. I have used it. You literally, under the bastion, there's a connect option. You just type in the IP address. It, it's that easy. And that could be in VNets that are in different Azure AD tenants. It could be on-premises via express route private peering or sites like VPN. Do think of the latency. Hey, if I'm on the East Coast and the resource I'm connecting to is on the East Coast, my bastion's on the West Coast, Hey, I'm, I'm hairpinning. So maybe I want to get a bastion deployed closer to those actual target resources. But that was it. As always, I hope this is useful. A lot of work goes into preparing for these, so a like and subscribe really is appreciated. But until the next video, uh, good luck and take care.